He was a superhero in the band world. I was a victim of uh, a rush to judgment. Now he's singing a different tune. Some kind of animal house fraternity. Playing defense on a whirlwind tour. Is just not accurate. Your questions, your reactions, his words. This does not change overnight. John Waters, live on ABC6. Now, ABC6 News at 5, on your side. He's the man we've been waiting to hear from since being fired from the Ohio State Marching Band. John Waters is here joining us in the studio live tonight to discuss the investigation the university conducted into the band culture. We're going to hear what he has to say in just a minute. First, though, we want to get you caught up. ABC6 reporter Adam Arrow here with a look back at what's gotten us to this point. It was May 22nd when a female band member filed a complaint with the university about a reported assault that happened during the fall band season. The next day, a parent complains about the band culture, and that kicks off the university's investigation into John Waters. A culture the university says was sexualized, including sexual nicknames, rookie tricks, a songbook filled with dirty rewrites of popular band tunes and Christmas carols, and a band practice called the Midnight Ramp, where band members marched into the stadium wearing underwear and some nothing at all. During the investigation, Waters was interviewed by OSU three times. The final meeting in mid-July with Provost John Steinmetz, who, according to OSU, orders the end of all troubling actions and says there may be further personnel action. To be a Buckeye is to represent our institution and our state at all times with humility, with integrity, and with a respect for one another. Then 10 days later, the university fires Waters. OSU University President Michael Drake saying they will not tolerate this behavior. Even one instance of harassment or hazing or assault is one too many. I have a passion for the band, and I don't want to see its reputation taken down. Immediately, there was backlash from band alumni. You turned a lighthearted joke and rookie name given to me by my roommates with my full consent. The idea is if you can march in your pajamas, in front of 224 other fellow band mates and friends, you can march in front of 200,000 people every weekend. And that was the idea. No one was forced to do it. From the air and online, the Scarlet and Gray faithful show their support with over $25,000 raised to help the embattled band director. Uh, this report makes that the culture is some kind of animal house fraternity is just not accurate. And just today, as Waters goes on a publicity tour, the university reiterates that Waters failed to inform others about the negative activities as required by university policy, despite having numerous opportunities to do so over the past 18 months. John Waters is back home tonight and in our studios after that whirlwind media tour, mostly to New York City today. And thank you, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Well, John, let's get right to it. What reason were you given for being fired? Well, I, I actually was not given a reason for being fired. In my letter of termination, it doesn't give a reason. Just no explanation. No at all. explanation. Do you think you deserve to be fired? No, I don't. And, and this is all because of a report that was flawed from its inception. It was flawed because uh, the complainant named the witnesses, and the witnesses were only four of 240 current band members and four additional of uh, uh, an alumni population of 4,000. And so I feel that, that from its inception, uh, the, the report aimed uh, to, to really take down the band. The band as a whole? Well, this is not just me. This is not just me. This is uh, all of the students who have marched. This is the alums who have uh, marched and given their time and their blood, sweat, and tears. And so, uh, you know, their reputations, too, have been uh, maligned by this report. By Absolutely. Being, being attached to a sexualized culture. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that was detailed in the investigation is this tradition. There's the investigation here. Mm -hmm. Is this tradition of the midnight ramp, as it's known. This is where band members essentially march down the ramp at the horseshoe at night, uh, man, many in their underwear, some even naked. And obviously this is a concern uh, for some of the parents that have been involved. And uh, you see this tradition. It goes back many, many years, back to when you were a band member. What is it like, and why did you not stop it? Well, indeed, I actually did stop it. 
and uh, that is not mentioned in the report. Uh, the, the Midnight Ramp is an event that dates back to the 1960s, uh, well before I was born, and uh, it is something that uh, the university has known about. The university police were present at Midnight Ramp. Uh, the the uh, field was unlocked for the band by uh, university officials. And so this is something that, that uh, has been going on for uh, decades and decades. You know, much like the, the Mirror Lake jump uh, in, in uh, November where uh, students in underwear uh, jump into Mirror Lake and, uh, and that is a university sanctioned event uh, complete with wristbands and a, and a you know, uh, fencing around uh, the Mirror Lake. And so um, I felt that the, the midnight ramp event needed to change. And there was, in fact, in all of this cultural talk and all of this cultural uh, uh, reporting, at no point did the university come to me and say, this needs to change that there's a problem here. Uh, it was only um, by uh, our team, our, our uh, staff, and our squad leaders that we began to address some of these issues because we felt very strongly that, uh, that yes, marching in the stadium in your underwear was not a, an, an appropriate thing viewed in today's yes. culture. You know, uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, yes, it could have been acceptable, but not in today's culture. And so uh, this is a perfect illustration, really, of the culture shaping that I have done with the band, the culture shaping that we've engaged in, because I think it's very important to understand that culture does not change, in my opinion, uh, until the students buy into it. The students have to own the problem and be the solution. And so that's been my mantra moving forward through all of the cultural shaping and the Midnight Ramp example. And so we, uh, we began, we've, we've talked about the Midnight Ramp for uh, some time now. And, uh, and we've talked about it individually with students and we've talked about it uh, with student leaders as a whole. And in fact, we decided as a group uh, that, and really my, my job was to hold up the mirror for all of yeah. us to look into and right. say, you know, this needs to change and how can we change it? And to a person, all of our student leaders agreed. And I was so proud of that moment because we agreed that we were gonna change it together and the students owned the problem yeah. and then we changed it together. Well, speaking of problems, another thing outlined in the report are nicknames given sexual in nature. Uh, every band member gets one. Many of them, again, sexual tones to them. There's the uh, OSU school songs, marching band, the lyrics mm. are changed to be sexual. There's these rookie tests that they take and it says, you know, things like, who's gay, who's lesbian, where would, did you first have sex, if you're a virgin, where did you first kiss, do this, do that. Are these things that went on while you were in the band? Is this just what's always been going on? Is that why, did you not think that this was wrong or inappropriate? No, absolutely. I, harassment of any type is absolutely wrong. And let me be very clear about that fact, that harassment shouldn't be tolerated in any form. This uh, and these things that you're talking about uh, are part of an underground culture uh, in the band and part of a culture that we as our staff members don't see. And, uh, and so when we were made aware of inappropriate nicknames. And you think about nicknames, by the way, and you think, you know, well, we call our friends by nicknames, we call our kids by nicknames. But when those nicknames become inappropriate, you have to take a stand. And so um, we did, in fact, take a stand against these nicknames and take a stand against inappropriate nicknames. So this kind of, uh, you know, underground culture uh, did exist uh, and when we were made aware of it, we, we changed it. There, were, there was an instance where there was an underground kind of uh, newsletter called a triptych, which was very um, uh, negative toward some students and mm -hmm. the authors were anonymous. Well, I intercepted a copy of this and, and I said, we are better than this. We are not going to do this to each other anymore. This is inappropriate. Uh, the words written in this thing are, are terrible. We are not going to do this anymore. And I found one of the student authors and we took disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, this songbook that you talk about, uh, I think the last date of its publication is, is if you look in there, 2006. Mm -hmm. And again, because it's in the underground subculture, 
uh, you know, these are not around the band. Well, if and it all existed before you, why do you think that you're the one person who gets fired for this and you've only been in charge, what, officially one year? This is well, your second, you know. Right. That, two, and that's what's baffling to me because all of this history and culture is being put onto my shoulders and, and the shoulders of our students, our current students. You know, our current students didn't call for this. Our current students didn't, uh, don't deserve um, this. And so, you know, uh, just rest assured that every time that there was an issue brought to our attention or that we found out about, we acted swiftly and immediately. And, and this songbook predates my leadership of the band. Uh, yet, you know, we're, we're being held responsible for that. Well, you've been with the band since 95, so clearly you grew up in a culture that at one time uh, didn't fall under right. the umbrella of sexual harassment training. That's a re reasonably recent development mm -hmm. in most uh, workplaces. So when you became the director, and even as interim director, what specifically did the university teach you about sexual harassment, and what steps did the university tell you to enact to change the culture? The university had no conversations with uh, us about sexual harassment training or anything. Uh, but I am proud to say that because I grew up in the culture of the band, which may be uh, in some eyes could have been acceptable some years ago but because I grew up in that culture I understood it very well and I understood that there was a need to change and so uh, we took steps I I'm very proud about my uh, record of um, of of changing the culture and we took steps as a staff because we looked in the mirror and said you know are these nicknames appropriate are are these uh you know are are our songs appropriate is the midnight ramp appropriate all of these things we self-actualized and owned as the problem and we addressed them all and so uh, the university was uh, was silent uh, through that entire time until this complaint is filed. And then uh, through a very flawed investigation, we, uh, we end up with uh, using past history, uh, past things. You know, some of the nicknames that were outlined in this report predate my leadership of the band. They're years and years old. And so, uh, again, this is all coming to fall on us. And, and you know, I, I am I'm happy to say that we own the problem. As a staff and as a group of student leaders, we own the issues, and we were indeed changing and making, uh, taking steps to change the culture. I want to get uh, quick to a statement from the university and see what you think about that. Ohio State University gave us a little more detail today on the investigation, saying that per Title IX, its investigation must be complete within 60 days. The university also said that you have yet to produce any factual examples that demonstrate change in band culture and that you were not forthcoming or truthful with the university on multiple occasions. This is what the university mm -hmm. is coming out with today. What, what say you about that? You know, there are, there are 240 factual examples. Uh, of our change, and those are the students. They can if, give specifics? If the university, well, I gave a report. I gave a, a six or seven page report to the university before my firing and before this report that they issued was made public. Mm -hmm. None of that information got into their report. So I think if, if uh, we are honest here and we, we ask the students themselves, they will say, you know, those are the living embodiments of the culture change. Uh, those are the examples of the culture uh, shifting and, and, and changing that we've done. And, and I am so proud to say that there's such a, uh, a, a culture of respect, a culture of caring, a culture of love amongst those students. And yes, you know, years ago, we, we had this culture and these silly sophomoric things uh, happening, but that's not happening anymore. And, and I will say also about culture that it doesn't change overnight. Mm -hmm. Culture is something that takes steady and constant pressure and constant monitoring all the time. You know, it doesn't turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. and, and we have been uh, on record. Uh, and, and, you know, if the university would like an example, they just need to look to their own students and, and understand that those students will tell them all of the cultural change that we've instituted.